I very recently completed my first ever marathon in a time of 3 hours, 20 minutes and 7 seconds at the 2024 Manchester Marathon. Now in today's video, as promised, I'm going to do a full race breakdown going through everything that happened on race day as well as the days leading up to the race. If you did happen to miss my race day video, I'll link it in the description below for you to catch up on. The stats on that video went absolutely nuts compared to any other video I've posted on my channel so I just want to take a quick second to say a massive thank you and if you did engage with that video honestly it meant the absolute world to me to see it do that well. Now pre-warning I have made quite a few notes from the marathon and there's also a fair bit of unseen footage from the weekend as well so I do warn you this video might be a little bit longer than my other ones. If you want to skip ahead to me talking about just the race then skip to this time code here but I'll also do the cool timestamp thing where you can see the different chapters and just skip ahead instead. However, I would also be super appreciative if you could watch this video all the way to the end. Maybe just whack it on while you're cooking dinner or doing some cleaning whatever helps you get through the day. Anyway, I'm not going to go into full detail about the entire week leading up to the race. All you really need to know about that week beforehand is I started carb loading on Thursday and I was trying my hardest to get at least eight hours sleep every single night before heading up to Manchester. So my family and I decided to travel up to Manchester on the Saturday before the race. This made the most sense as it meant we didn't have to worry about getting stuck in traffic and it also meant that I could do my shakeout run after travelling which I will get onto a little bit later in the video. We left at 9am on Saturday morning and after one motorway pee break we made it to the Trafford Centre in Manchester right around 11.30am. We couldn't check into our hotel until about 3 o'clock so we headed straight into the Trafford Centre for some food and please don't judge me here but I may have devoured 20 McDonald's chicken nuggets in the space of about five or ten minutes without even flinching. Don't get me wrong, I know there was probably better things I could have eaten the day before a race, but there was also definitely a lot worse things I could have eaten, so it depends which side of the coin you're looking at. After food, we basically just had a mooch around the shops and didn't really do too much. I made it very clear to my family that at three o'clock, I really wanted to go to the hotel, get checked in and get my shakeout run done as soon as possible. So I had as much time as possible to recover after it. And believe it or not, that's actually what we did. I found a very convenient one mile loop right next to the hotel for my shakeout. So my plan was to do two or three laps until my legs felt like all the travel fatigue had been released or shaken out, if you will. Truthfully, I never really understood the point in shakeout runs. Like it didn't make sense to me why you do literally one or two miles the day before a race. But after traveling since nine o'clock this morning and spending the last four hours shopping at the Trafford Center, which I probably wouldn't advise. It's definitely helped to loosen the weight in my legs. Um, and I definitely feel better and more fresh for tomorrow. So the only things left for today are hopefully a really nice carb-based meal at ZZ's in the Trafford Centre. And then get back to the hotel, chill, watch some race videos to try and pump myself up. And then it's race day. Let's see what the rest of Saturday has in store. I ended up doing two loops, bringing my shakeout run to a staggering 2.01 miles in a total time of 16 minutes and 40 seconds. I fully ran to feel for the entire two miles and thankfully my heart rate stayed at a delightful 144 beats per minute. I do actually have a quick question for any seasoned marathon runners watching this video. How long should a shakeout run be? because I fully went out on a whim and just guessed how long mine was meant to be. So please comment your shakeout wisdom down below because this was genuinely the first time in the last 16 weeks where I had no idea how long I was meant to be running for. Saturday finished with a delightful meal at ZZ's with cheesy garlic bread for my starter and a lasagna that had like 25 layers of pasta sheets. Carbs, carbs and more carbs. We didn't really hang around too much after 
after dinner, we headed straight back to the hotel, I had a shower, and then I got my race kit out ready for the morning. This actually included putting my bib number on because I am a perfectionist and I did not want to be stressing about this first thing in the morning. Massive shout out to Eric Floberg for inspiring me to do this the night before because it was a lifesaver. You've got to feel good to race good. I was in bed by half nine, 10, and I'm pretty certain I was asleep by at least half 11 at the latest. Race morning started with a 5.30 a.m. wake up call, ready for a six o'clock breakfast at the hotel. Now, luckily the hotel we were staying in opened breakfast up early on race morning for all of the runners, which was a blessing in disguise. So thank you so much, Premier Inn Trafford Center. Now I tried my absolute hardest to keep my breakfast as similar to home as possible so I ended up with one and a half bagels, two bananas and a glass and a half of apple juice. I would highly urge anyone running a marathon in the near or far future to try and do this because the last thing you want to do is upset your stomach on race day with brand new foods. And yeah I completely understand that this might be really boring and the full English breakfast might look really enticing but I promise you it's probably not gonna help you as much as you think. Unless that's what you're used to. If that's what you're used to, go wild. Whilst I was eating my breakfast, I was also sipping on a Science in Sport electrolyte drink that I'd made up first thing in the morning as soon as I'd woken up. Now I don't actually remember the exact amount of sodium that this had in it. I'll flash it on the screen now, but this was essentially a last minute Hail Mary to try and get my electrolytes as topped up as possible. We did have to catch a tram to the event village, but luckily it was only a 15 minute tram ride from the hotel we were staying in. So we hopped on the tram about 7:20 a.m. we had a short walk to the event village and we arrived right around eight o'clock in the morning in all fairness this was nearly an hour and a half before my wave was intended to start but i'd much rather have been there and know that i'm there early than be rushing to get on a crowded tram and just stressing myself out it was right around this time that i had my first toilet break i used one of the portaloos just outside of the event village as they were still reasonably quiet even though they were meant for spectators. I then proceeded to get changed into my race shoes and then everything that I didn't need I dumped into a bag which I handed off to my dad who had very kindly come to the event village with me first thing in the morning. And then it was at this point I waved goodbye to my dad and I headed into the event village. Everything up until this point still felt a bit surreal but the moment I walked into the event village I saw Nick Bester warming up and all the nerves kicked in and suddenly what I was about to do became a massive reality. With those nerves came the need for another loo break so I did what every single running YouTuber has told me to do. I joined a port loo queue, had a wee and then rejoined the queue as soon as I came out of the toilet. I started my warm-up right after my third pee stop about 9 40 a.m before heading into the start process bang on nine o'clock. One two three! <laughs> It was at this point I took my first high five gel of the day and this would give me 30 minutes to digest it before starting my race. And to my surprise they were running bang on time and my race started at exactly 9.40 a.m. as planned. So for anyone that doesn't know my target for Manchester was to run a 3.12 marathon. However I was actually starting in the 3.45 starting pack. Now this wasn't a massive issue however I did try my absolute hardest to be at the front of my starting corral when we came to the start line. And luckily, I actually ended up only being one or two rows back from the start when the gun went off. So I tried my hardest to stay as calm as possible going into the first few miles of the race because I knew I'd be the kind of person to bolt off right at the start. Being in the slow group did kind of help as there wasn't that many people rushing to get past me, which meant I could settle into my own rhythm pretty quickly. Mile one came and went so quickly quickly and I was slightly ahead of my target pace coming in with a 718 for my first mile but truthfully that entire mile went so fast and I couldn't even tell you what I was thinking about at that point in the race. Miles two to four I really tried to hone in on hitting my target pace running a 710 for mile two, a 714 for mile three and a 721 for mile four. It was right around this point that I met a dude called 
Max. I didn't actually find out his name was Max until about mile eight, but all I did know was that me and him were going for a very similar target time, so running with him surely wasn't going to be a bad idea. Was this a good idea? Who knows? What I can say is I felt really strong in these opening miles and felt like everything I'd done up until this point had been done right and I hadn't missed anything I'd planned to do. Now miles 5 to 10 were net downhill and I don't think I realised this until it was too late. The annoying thing about downhills is you don't realise just how much energy they actually take up until you've finished going down the hill. I took my first gel at mile 5 still feeling strong but I did not noticed that I was one minute ahead of where I wanted to be. Now when it's done over 26 miles a one minute buffer is nothing to be worried about but when it's done over five miles that probably should have been a sign that I was going a little bit too fast. But me being the naive first time marathon runner I am felt really good and decided to keep that pace up. Mile 5 was a 7.06, mile 6 was a 7.05, and mile 7 was a 7.07. .07. Now, I knew that the plan was meant to be 7 minutes 20 per mile at this point in the race, but I also knew that there was a set of hills coming up, and banked time could only play in my favour. Mile 9 was my fastest split of the entire race, with a perfect 7 minute split. And between mile 9 and 10 was when I sadly had to say goodbye to Max as he started to experience some pretty severe pains in his side and had to drop his pace right back to cope. Max, it was a pleasure meeting you and thank you so much for helping me through those first 10 miles. Having Max there for the first 10 miles of the race made it so much less intimidating, but the moment he dropped back, it suddenly hit that I still had 16 miles to conquer. But nonetheless, I took my second gel right around this time and kept on trying to tick the miles off. It was at this point that I knew the next block of miles were the only hills of the course and this is where people famously get caught out at Manchester. So miles 10, 11 and 12 I really pulled my pace back averaging between 7.14 to 7.19 across these three miles, trying my absolute hardest for what was about to come. Now hills are nothing new to me, I more than anyone should be used to running hills because the country roads I have done all of my training on either start or end with a hill. I went through halfway in about 1.34ish which gave me a delightful two minute buffer on where I had intended to be at that point in the race. However this did also mean I was getting faster rather than trying to slow down and actually control my pace which I probably should have realised was a bit of a dumb move. The main hill came between mile 14 and 16, as shown by this delightful Strava elevation chart. And the splits for these three miles were 7.14 for mile 14, 7.18 for mile 15, and then 7.32 for mile 16. My slowest split of the entire race so far. And I can't even lie, even with all of the hills I run on every single day throughout my training, that hill in Manchester was a monster. And it was at that point I knew I should have trusted my original plan and I shouldn't have gone out as fast as I did because I really should have trusted my gut and I should have just stuck with the plan I actually spent time creating. But also this shows where I lack marathon experience and it is something that I will never do again thanks to learning it the hard way. The race very quickly turned into a positive split race at this point with miles 17, 18 and 19 all being between 7.20 to 7.35 per mile pace. I did then set a new record for myself on mile 20 with a time of 7.55 for that mile. Yep a new record for the slowest mile of the race so far. This record was quickly broken by mile 21, which came in at 8.07. And this was the first time in the entire race where I'd started taking sweets and drinks from spectators because I genuinely needed anything I could get to help me get through that last 10k. And in all fairness, mile 22 wasn't much better. It was more a desperate attempt to just keep pushing and try my absolute hardest to get as close to my target pace as possible. And then came mile 23, where I was well and truly humbled. Mile 23 came in at nine minutes and 30 seconds. 
over two minutes slower than what I wanted to be running at that point in the marathon. It's safe to say that I was well and truly in the pits at this point and I even remember texting my family group chat from my watch saying I was in the pits and them thinking that meant I was in the first aid tent because I had hurt myself. Honestly I wish I was in the first aid tent at that point because the mental challenge I was facing was by far one of the most draining things I have ever been put through. And I want to be fully transparent here, I did take a moment to refocus and regroup before absolutely sending the last 5k of this race. And to add to that, I definitely would have taken so much longer to get back into the race if it hadn't have been for the 330 pacer who literally yelled at me to keep running. So that is exactly what I did, I kept running and vowed that I would not stop until my body was over that finish line. I sat with the 330 pacer for the entire final 5k of this race and it was by far the best decision I probably had made throughout the entire race. This dude must have been well into his 50s and he was having the time of his life. He got all of the spectators roaring for us, he was checking in with every single runner around him and he was just carrying so many people across that finish line. Mile 24 was 8.28, mile 25 was 8.04 and mile 26 was 8.06 bringing me in with a final time of 3 hours, 20 minutes and 7 seconds, which still completely obliterated my C goal of 3 hours 30. Now I was a bit confused as I didn't understand how I could be running with a 3.30 pacer but finish 10 minutes ahead of him with a 3.20 time. Well it turns out that this was actually the 3.30 pacer from the wave before me and therefore meant he actually started 10 minutes ahead of me. Crossing that finish line brought a whole wave of emotion I have never felt before. The fact that the last 16 weeks of training had finally paid off and I was surrounded by thousands of other people who had just achieved the exact same thing as me was a feeling I have never felt before in any other sport I have ever competed in. Now my body desperately wanted to cry and I could even feel myself welling up but I don't think I had any moisture left inside of me and I ended up looking like I had had a severe allergic reaction to something. I honestly didn't believe it when people told me that the feeling you get when you finish your first marathon is one you will never experience again in your life. But honestly, as someone who has just completed theirs, it really is something so special. And if I had one piece of advice for anyone who is going to do their first marathon anytime soon, do not take that moment for granted and soak it all in because it will not last forever. And by God, it does feel good. I'm getting emotional just talking about it. And that kind of brings my first ever marathon to a close, which does lead me on to the next important question. What's next? In terms of videos for the channel, the running content is 100% here to stay. I have, without a shadow of a doubt, had the most fun over the last 16 weeks making these videos and it has made my running so much more enjoyable. And I'd love to know the types of videos you want me to make or even the races you want to see me enter. So please head to the comment section now and leave a suggestion or two of the next race you want me to enter or even just a style of video you want to see me create. In terms of races for the remainder of the year I do have a half marathon that I'm eyeing up in October which will probably have a proper build series just like this to go along with it. However I do kind of want to enter some shorter distances soon to see if I can beat any of my PBs since training for the marathon. And then next year well next year we're gonna go big. More to come on that in a future video. And finally I just want to say a massive thank you for all of the support and engagement on all of the videos throughout this series. Whether you like it or not you all played a pivotal role in me completing the marathon and gave me so much motivation to keep training and keep making the videos. And I'm fully aware that my channel is literally a tiny pinprick in the massive world of YouTube but you all do play a pivotal role in the videos, so once again, thank you. So with all that being said, I hope the rest of your day is absolutely smashing, and don't forget what I've been telling you since day one, no bad days.